just a moment, I'll be reading from Revelation chapter 14. If you'd like to use your Bibles, we'll be reading from Revelation chapter 14. But before that, I'd like to welcome everyone here to this evening's service. If you're visiting with you, we welcome you to uh, our services here at Carthage and invite you back at any opportunity that you have. Scripture reading will be Revelation chapter 14, verses 6 and 7. Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea, and springs of water. All the songs should be on the PowerPoint, but if you wish to follow up in a songbook, uh, the first one will be number 234. 234. I serve a prison savior, he's in the world today.
number 124. Fun singing this song, but Michael is singing our opening prayer. Bow with me, please. Our God and our Father in heaven, we're so thankful for this, another opportunity to assemble together in this building, Father, and to worship thee as one. Father, we are so thankful for the privilege of prayer where we can come to thee, Father, and lay out our petitions and our desires. And we know, Father, that you are listening and it's all in your will. Father, we're so thankful for all the many blessings of life. You've blessed us well beyond what we need, Father. And we pray that we will never take those blessings for granted. Father, we're so thankful for this congregation. So thankful for Brother Edward and the work he does here, Father. We pray many more years of work in thy kingdom. Father, we are so thankful to Thee for Thy grace and Thy mercy and Thy love for us. For Thy ultimate plan of sending Thy Son to this earth to teach and to preach and to be that perfect example that we may all strive to follow. Father, we pray that we would study Thy Word daily. That we would put all those many things that You would have us to do into our lives and that we would be stronger Christians and that all those around us would see us and in our, our actions and Father would desire to be a part of thy family. 
Dear Lord, we are mindful of those that are mentioned this morning, those that are sick and shut in, those that are suffering the loss of loved ones. But no, Father, there are many we may not even know about. We pray that your, your love and your divine hand would be upon them. Father, as we go into this holiday weekend, we do reflect back on all those men and women that were willing to stand and some to even give that ultimate sacrifice so that we would have the freedoms that we do. We pray, pray Father, that you would bless those men and women that are still serving today, Father, that you would keep them safe and that you would return them to their families as soon as possible. Lord, now ask, it, ask that you would be with Brother Edward as he's about to bring another lesson, lesson upon us. We pray, Father, that we would be ready listeners and that we would put those things into our hearts and our minds. We ask, Father, that you would continue to guide and guard and direct us, steer us down that narrow path, forgive us when we fail thee. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. We wish to mark the psalm of invitation will be number 179. 179. Now, if you would, turn to 788. had a wonderful period of singing and a season of prayer, and now we come to a study of God's Word. I would like to invite you to take your Bibles and turn to the ninth chapter of the book of Mark, where our study will be found for tonight. Barry has a couple of the uh, study guides remaining from this morning, and if you did not get one and would like to have one at this time, get his attention as he comes down the aisle, and he will get one for you. And you can take some notes, which I hope you will do on tonight's lesson. In Mark chapter 9, there is recorded an episode in the life of our Lord that has to do with casting a dumb spirit out of a young man. And the father is very distraught about his son. And as you begin reading in verse 14, and you you see this uh, event develop, and 
a mu great multitude has gathered and there was one individual in that multitude that sought the Lord's attention. And verse 17, he said, Master, I have brought unto thee my son who has a dumb spirit. And wheresoever he taketh him, he teareth him, and he foams and gnashes with his teeth and pineth away. And I spake to your disciples that they should cast him out, and they could not. He answered him and said, O faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him unto me. And they brought him unto him. That's Jesus. And when he saw him, straightway the spirit tear him, and he fell on the ground and wallowed, foaming. And he asked his father, How long is it since this came upon him? And he said of a child. You've been suffering like this. Reminds you somewhat of epileptic seizures or something to that effect. But this is attributed, remember, to an evil spirit. He said, oft times it has cast him into the fire and into the waters to destroy him. But if thou canst do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Look at this father's pleading and pitiful cry. He desires something better for his son. He has been tormented for so long. And he says in effect to Jesus, if there is anything that you can do to help us, please, please do it. And Jesus said unto him, if thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believes. And straightway the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe, help thou my unbelief. He was a believer, but he wanted to be a stronger believer. When Jesus saw that the people came running together, he rebuked the foul spirit, saying unto him, Thou dumb and deaf spirit, I charge thee, come out of him and enter no more into him. And we are told that the spirit cried and rent him sore and came out of him. And he was as one dead, insomuch that many said, he is dead. But I want you to notice especially verse 27. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up, and he arose. We're not going to go into great detail about the demon possession that was characteristic of many during this period of time. I have stated before and still maintain this is my opinion about it. My conviction is that this was a period of time during which the power of Jesus Christ came head to head with the power of the evil one, the devil. There were those who were possessed of demons, and Jesus illustrated his power over demons over and over and over again. He has proven during his earthly ministry to have power over all things. And the miraculous works that he did fall into so many categories. He had the power over nature. There's an episode involving the Apostle Peter wanting to walk on the water to meet Jesus. And when he took his eye off him, he began to sink. Matthew 14, you can read about that. And Jesus reached forth and caught him. He rescued Peter. Here he lifts this young man who is evidently so exhausted from what has been going on that he is thought to be dead. But the emphasis that I want to make tonight is Jesus lifted him up. 
I would suggest to you that Jesus can still lift people up. He is able to lift us all up. But the application that I want to make of that tonight is that we as Christians, as God's people, should seek to follow the example of Jesus. Not that we're able and have the power to do the miracles as He did them. But we do have the ability to lift others up. Those that are dead spiritually... We have the opportunity to share the gospel with them, to bring them the good tidings of good news, and to lift them up from sin through the teaching and preaching of God's holy word. We sang the song, plant, Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. The Lord is able to bring us up to that higher ground where we can stand before Him, pleasing in His sight, and be more noble in our living and in our conduct. So that's the emphasis that I want to give in this lesson. What kind of lives lift others up? How can we do more in lifting people up as children of God? In the first place, I want us to think of lives that are sympathetic. We need to be sympathetic toward others. And there are so many passages where this is borne out. Turn with us to Romans 12. There in verse 15, we know it from memory, I'm sure, but look at it again with me. Rejoice with them that do rejoice, and weep with them that weep. Yes, we should have joy with those who are rejoicing. Sometimes people are a little bit jealous of people who, to whom something good happens, and, and they seem to sort of resent it. Christians should never resent when something good happens to their fellow Christians or to their fellow man. We should rejoice with them in that and never have the attitude of, why not me? Instead of him, why not me? Well, why not him instead of me? That's the attitude that we need to have. But look at the latter part of that verse. And weep with them who weep. There's a lot of weeping in our world. People weep when they lose loved ones. We need to be sympathetic during that time. And so many of you are because we have the thank you notes to prove it over the years. People thanking all the church members here for sending cards and so on during times of sorrow. But there are other times other than deaths when we need to be sympathetic and understanding. Jesus had sympathy. I'm planning a lesson from John 11 before long, but remember it is said that Jesus wept. Jesus wept. We talked about that a little bit this afternoon at the decoration service up near Gladys. We read extensively from John 11 and called attention to how People were suffering then the same things that we suffer. They had carried Lazarus to the silent city of the dead, and Mary and Martha were grieving terribly. And there were people who were assembled with them who were grieving. They had the same experiences that we have today. People have been doing that for a long time. But notice there were those there comforting them just as we go and try to comfort people. Jesus was sympathetic. Sometimes people debate why Jesus wept and all kinds of suggestions are made. One has to do with the fact that he knew Lazarus was going to have to die again. He'd already experienced death, but he would be raised from the dead and Lazarus would have to go through that all again. 
The very next chapter, you have Lazarus sitting at a table eating. Just like he had before. He's been restored to normal life from the dead. The great lesson from that parable is that Jesus had the power to raise him from the dead and he has the power subsequently to raise all of us from the dead which he shall do when he comes again but don't miss that point that Jesus was sympathetic he wept because he loved Lazarus in Luke chapter 10 we read about the good Samaritan oh how we love that story it is so powerful. The unlikely individual is the one who had sympathy on the man who was in trouble. The priest and the Levite didn't have time to help him. They were afraid to get involved. But the good Samaritan stopped and assisted him. He bound up his wounds. He used his own beast to put the man on and to have him taken to take him to the inn where he put him up for the night and said, you know, here's some extra money to take care of him for an extended period of time if need be. And if there's any more expense, I'll take care of it when I come through the next time. Here was a man who was sympathetic. He saw someone who had been beaten and robbed. He lifted him up and put him on his beast of birth. We need to lift people up. And we can do that by being sympathetic. And then we need to seek to live lives that are refreshing. I have been blessed through the years to have been refreshed by so many people in the Lord's church. I have gone to preach in gospel meetings and there would be maybe the preacher and his wife, sometimes other people, who would say, I know it will be impossible for you to drive back home this afternoon. I want you to come to our house. We have a, <clears throat> a room prepared for you. And you would go, and, and it's usually the sister, you know, the lady of the house, he says, now everything is in a state of readiness. If you need anything else, you let us know. The bed is already turned back. If you want to take a nap, you take a nap. You do whatever you want to do. We'll be in this end of the house. You'll be in that end of the house. That type of hospitality is really refreshing, especially when you're away from home. So many of you have been among those who have refreshed me in Barbara from time to time, and in so many ways. But I want you to notice what an emphasis is given to this in 2 Timothy chapter 1. 2 Timothy chapter 1, Paul says, beginning in verse 16, The Lord give mercy unto the house of Onesiphorus, for he oft refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chain. Paul is bound during this time. He's a prisoner. He's in shackles. Lots of times we don't want to be around those people. If we see someone walking into the courthouse and he has shackles on his feet and shackles on his hands, we say, well, that must be a pretty mean dude, you know. It could be that he is, could be that he's not. He may have just made a bad mistake in life. And saw Paul could have been taken for a common criminal, though he had done nothing really wrong. But he had pleaded his case to Caesar, and so he had to be bound and taken to Rome. But Onesiphorus did not feel a sense of shame. He was not ashamed of Saul or Paul rather. And Paul tells Timothy on occasion, one of the words that really stands out in the books to Timothy is that word ashamed. Don't be ashamed of me. Don't be ashamed of the gospel. Don't be ashamed of the Lord. Just don't be ashamed of those things that are right and good. 
But notice that he says of this saint that he hath refreshed me often. He has often been a source of refreshment to me. Look again at the little book of Philemon. In verse 7, he said, uh, Paul writing to Philemon said, For we have great joy and consolation in thy love, because the bowels of the saints are refreshed by thee, brother. The bowels of the saints, their innermost being, they have been refreshed, they've been lifted up by you. And so this was a compliment to Philemon. And then go to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. And let's look at a couple of verses there, really three verses. In 2 Corinthians 3, beginning verse 1, Paul said, Do we begin again to commend ourselves, or need we, as some others, epistles of commendation to you, or letters of commendation from you? You are our epistle written in our hearts, known and read of all men. For as much as you are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone, but in fleshly tables of the heart. Paul is telling these Corinthian brethren, you have refreshed the hearts of God's people. We need to live such lives that we will be an epistle known and read by all men. To lift people up, we need to live lives that are sympathetic, lives that are refreshing, but also lives that are spiritual. If a brother be overtaken in a fall, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. Galatians 6 verse 1 states. Well, who are these spiritual people that he's talking about? Look at Colossians 3 for a moment, beginning in verse 1. If you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sits on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. Those are the spiritual ones. They are those whose affections are on heaven, not on things of the earth. They are those who are aware of the fact that Christ sits on the right hand of God exalted, that He rules and reigns over their lives. They willingly and lovingly submit to Him as the one who is the head over the church. Looking back just a moment to the book of Romans, there in chapter 8, I believe it's verse 6, Paul said, For to be carnally minded is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. That's the spiritual. Those who live such lives as directed by the Spirit that will produce li a life of peace. So are we living that kind of a life? That's the kind of life that will lift others up. A fourth characteristic is that we're to live lives that are consistent. Consistent, not hypocritical. Turning back to Romans chapter 2 for a moment, Paul has delivered what some would call a scathing rebuke of the Gentile world in Romans 1. He has reminded them of just how evil they are, and correctly so, because the Roman civilization was exceedingly corrupt in the first century. During that period of time, all sorts of things were going on, and Paul catalogs a lot of the sins that the Gentiles were committing. But then when he comes to chapter 2, he addresses the Jewish people who are Christians. 
And he reminds the Jews that they are guilty of doing the same thing. Look in verse 1 of the chapter. Therefore thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judgest, for wherein you judge another, you condemn yourself, because you that judge do the same things. They would condemn in others what they themselves were doing. What is that? That is the height of inconsistency. Jesus talked about some of the Jewish leaders who would bind heavy burdens to be borne by others, but they wouldn't even lift a finger to help them. And he said, that is not as it should be. But look a little bit further down in verses 21 through 24. He said, Thou therefore who teach another, teachest thou not thyself? And thou that preachest, that a man should not steal, dost thou steal? Thou that sayest a man should not commit adultery, dost thou commit adultery? Thou that abhorrest idols, dost thou commit sacrilege? Thou that makest thy boast of the law, through breaking the law, dishonorest thou God? For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles through you, as it is written. The Gentiles saw the inconsistency of the Jews just as the Jews looked down upon the Gentiles because of their abhorrent sins. The Gentiles said, oh, we're in the same boat. You do the same thing. And Paul reminded them that they were. What kind of a life is that? It's inconsistent life. It's not going to have the impact that it ought to have for Christ and for His cause. In uh, Titus chapter 1, verse 16, has Paul saying, They profess that they know God, but in works they deny Him, being abominable and disobedient, and unto every good work reprobate. There's just nothing good and wholesome about them. They're disobedient. They commit all kinds of abominations. They profess that they know God, but in works they deny. It's an inconsistent life. We need as Christians to avoid that. A fifth thing that we need to remember is that if we're going to lift up others, we need to live lives that are cooperative. Look back at Romans 12 for a moment. This is oftentimes called the little Bible because there are so many pointed practical applications within the chapter. But Paul in verses 3 and 4 <clears throat> said, For I say through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God has dealt to every man the measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, so we, being many, are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another. I do not have to give you a course in biology. I can leave that up to Denise. She's taught that for a long time. But all of us know that there are so many different members of the body. You know, I mean, the joints even of the skeleton on which this flesh is carried, it's just it's astounding. We're fearfully and wonderfully made, the psalmist said, and that is so accurate an assessment, isn't it? But the members of the body work together. They're one. It's amazing to me at some of the things, some of the moves that some of the great athletes can make today. And the things that they can do with their body. Getting into all kinds of contortions and shapes, you know. It's just astounding to think about. The body must cooperate. 
the members of the body cooperate. So what is Paul telling us here? As Christians, we're members of a body. Not just anybody, the body of Christ. And we are going to have to be cooperative. You know, it's amazing what we can accomplish as the Lord's church when we're not overly concerned about who gets the credit. We want God to be given the glory. We want Him to get the credit. We want to do what we do to praise Him and to lift His name up. There evidently were not very many problems in the church at Philippi. But there just happens to be a couple of women who are mentioned in a way that causes us to realize that perhaps they did not have the proper spirit and attitude toward one another and consequently toward the Lord and His church. And all that Paul says is, I beseech you, Odious, and beseech Syntyche, that they be of the same mind in the Lord. Many believe that that implies that these two women were not of the same man. And when you stop and analyze it, you would have to say that that's a logical conclusion because why would Paul say, I beg you, I plead with you two women to be of the same man? Had they been of the same man, he would have never said that to them, would he? The Holy Spirit would have never directed him to say, I want you to write this to these two ladies. Remind them who they are. They evidently were not cooperative with one another. The Lord wants us to be cooperative. A sixth point is that if we're going to lift up others, we're going to have to live lives that are zealous. In the book of Titus, again, chapter 2, verse 14, familiar passage, but sometimes we forget it. Paul reminds us earlier on that we're to deny ungodliness and worldly lust, to live soberly, righteously, and godly in this world, and so on. And he talks about that Christ gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. Zeal is so important. We need to be energetic and enthusiastic in our approach to Christianity. If we could capture the zeal that some people have for athletic teams or a political uh, uh, operative that is running for some particular office or for a thousand and one other things that people are so zealous about, it would be astounding at the change that would occur in the Lord's church. In Romans 12, verse 11, Paul said, Not slothful in spirit, or in business rather, fervent in spirit. That word fervent denotes having a burning fire of enthusiasm within us. Fervency is needed in spirit. And then he went on to say, uh, serving the Lord. That's to be characteristic of our service to the Lord. In Acts chapter 8, we learn or have an example of someone who was very enthusiastic in doing what he did for the Lord. You have Philip coming to the chariot. He heard the man reading from Isaiah the prophet. And Luke specifically mentions that he ran. I remember an individual a few years ago who penned an article being critical of the fundamental preaching of the gospel of Christ and those who were standing for the faith once delivered. And he envisioned himself, described himself sitting in a traditional church. The gospel was being preached and he said, oh yes, he's going to tell us the story again about Philip and the unit. If I hear one more time, he ran. I think I'm just going to get up and walk out. 
Isn't it a shame that people would be embarrassed by a point being made about the enthusiasm that Philip had in carrying the gospel to a man who was lost? Philip ran. I believe because he had a sense of urgency. He realized that this was an important task and a great opportunity. Let's live lives that are zealous. And finally, lives that are truthful will lift others up too. We're to speak the truth to one another, Ephesians 4.25. We are to be truthful in our daily conversations and in our relationships with our families and our friends and our loved ones and rank strangers. We're to be truthful in our communication. As we preach and teach, we are to tell the truth, Ephesians 4.15 tells us. And you look at so many passages. Solomon emphasized in the Proverbs so many times the importance of truth. He said, buy the truth and don't sell it. You pay whatever you have to to gain it, and once you have it, don't give it up. Don't sell it at any cost. My late father-in-law learned that you don't price things that you don't want to sell. Because sooner or later, someone will buy and pay you gladly what you are asking for a really good coon hound, for example. Oh, yeah, I'd sell her, but you wouldn't give me what I'd have to ask you. Well, how much do you ask me? So he popped off and priced her, and I'll take her. She'd already <clears throat> won several trophies. And people who were into that business, they knew the value of a good tuna. The truth is something you can't afford to lose. You can't afford to set aside. Buy it at whatever the cost and never sell it. You may have to burn the midnight oil to find it, but you burn the midnight oil and get some more if you need it. Are we living lives that will lift others up? I think all of us are striving to do that, but we could all make improvement. So let's work on these points that we've made tonight. Lives that are sympathetic, refreshing, spiritual, consistent, cooperative, zealous, and truthful. All really good points for us to think about. If you've never obeyed the gospel, you have that opportunity and you'll have no better time than right now. And the Lord can still lift your life out of sin just as he lifted that formerly possessed young man up and like he lifted Peter into the ark or into the boat. Rather. So if you're a person who has never obeyed, we taught you and told you this morning what you need to do. Hear the gospel, you believe it, you turn from sin and repentance, confess the name of Christ and are baptized into Him for the remission of your sins. You're an erring child of God, then come back home and ask God's forgiveness like Simon the sorcerer did in Acts 8, and you can be restored. Come at your subject as we stand and sing. God is
turn to 268. If you're here tonight and you have not had the opportunity to partake of the Lord's Supper, if you'll come forward during the singing of the first verse of this song, you'll be served. 268. God and Father in heaven, we're indeed thankful for another beautiful Lord's Day that you've blessed us with, and thank you for the opportunity that we have to gather around our table each first day of the week in remembrance of Jesus who suffered and died that cruel death on the cross for our sins. Thank you for this unleavened bread which so fitly represents the body of our Lord that hung on that cross, and we pray that these partake of it as they do so in a manner well pleasing unto thee. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. In like manner, Heavenly Father, we thank you for the cup, the fruit of the vine, which to us as Christians represents that precious blood that Jesus shed on the cross for our sins. Pray, Heavenly Father, please partake of it, they do so in a manner well pleasing unto thee. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for every day of life and for the many blessings we receive each and every day that we live. Especially thankful for the country that you've given us to live in. Thank you for our job and our health and our ability to go out and work and earn a portion of this world good. Pray, Heavenly Father, that they give back, that they give back cheerfully and that the offering to take it here tonight might be used in every way possible to spread the borders of our kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Barry, the closing song will be 332 for those who did not hear that if you're utilizing the book. We appreciate so much your being here tonight. This is a holiday weekend, and some people say it's the official beginning of summer. Uh, but it seems like it's been summer for several days to me. Uh, but uh, we have several people away from us, and we're hoping that they'll be able to be back. Uh, Johnny Law's family are in, is in Jamestown tonight. Uh, due to the loss of a family member, they're having a funeral service there tonight for a member of the Smith family. Uh, that uh, his mother was a Smith, and uh, they came off of Flins Creek, migrated to Jamestown. Have been very instrumental in the work of the church there, and uh, 
we want to remember that family in our prayers. I do not have the name. I didn't make a note of that. And also, someone told me that uh, Miss Bobby Jean Phillips passed away. I do not have the specifics on that service, or if they have even made arrangements yet. But you can. I'm sorry. Eleven o'clock tomorrow. Tuesday here. At, all right. We're hastily having a business meeting. 11 o'clock Tuesday at Sanderson's. All right. All right. Let's remember that family in our prayers, too. And also, Sister Dimple Hicks has not been feeling well for several days, and we had failed to mention that. Uh, we just always think that Dimple is going to be here, and she hasn't been feeling well for some time. And let's remember her in our prayers. And I think Jerry and Cheryl were out of town, too, and Jackie and Judy, and I don't know who all else. But anyway... Let's keep all of these in our prayers as they travel. Remember Scotty, he did not get the stents removed this last week. He was going to at Cookville, but they delayed that, and it's going to be a while longer. Remember the triplet baby's basket that is out there? Uh, that's not three baskets now. That's for the triplet baby, last name triplet. I've been asked, I told somebody this morning, Derek, and I've been asked many times, I'd say something about the triplets at church, and they'd say, oh, you have, you have triplets at Carthage? And they're thinking three siblings, you know. Uh, but uh, anyway, we want to remember that and remember our vacation Bible school, and uh, that will be the uh, 4th through the 8th. And uh, so Thursday will be on the 7th, and that morning we're going to plan on taking a breakfast trip to Cracker Barrel. It'll be the first Thursday in uh, June, so keep that in mind. We've also been asked to remember Alicia Haynes in our prayers, along with Floyd Massey and Sister Joe Norton. Joe went with us to count for so many times. There will be a VBS meeting after services here for room assignments and so on. I imagine that will be down front here. Are there any other announcements that need to be made? Thank you. I'm sorry. Excuse me. Sixteenth of June. One, okay, be one day VBS. Okay. Keep that in mind. Also, our prayers were requested for Tom Brown, a friend of uh, Jeff Crockett's. He's the Putnam County Fire Chief. He's been diagnosed with leukemia and is currently undergoing treatments, and our prayers are asked for him as well. If there's nothing further, let's plan to be back Wednesday night, and VBS workers, remember the meeting for you down front. Let's stand for the closing song and prayer. Father, we come to you giving thanks for this beautiful day you bless us with. Thankful for the opportunity that we've had to come and study and worship you. And thankful for the country in which we live that we can't assemble without fear. We pray, Heavenly Father, that everything said and done has been done in accordance to your will. We pray now for all those that were just mentioned that in need of our prayers, those that are recovering and also those that are suffering from the loss of loved ones. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you be with all those that on this day that have given their life and fighting for this country. We pray that everybody be remembrance of them and, and their family and their sacrifice. We realize, Heavenly Father, that we are weak and sinful creatures and we say and do things contrary to your, your will. We pray that you'll forgive us these things. We pray that you'll keep a safe hand over us and bring us back the next morning night. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.